Hi. This video presentation is designed to support students writing their final research paper on Paul's Thorn in the Flesh. Now the bulk of your paper should constitute an exegetical or expositional analysis of the key biblical texts associated with this topic, specifically 2 Corinthians 12. Now because Paul is the best interpreter of Paul, you will also want to look at other passages in Paul's letters which might help shed light on this passage, such as Galatians 4, verses 13 to 14, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Keep in mind that your primary aim is to identify what, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, based exclusively on your interaction with what Paul himself says in his letters. You may refer to the secondary sources, by that I mean scholarly commentaries and journal articles, but as conversation partners in achieving your goal. But your assignment is not merely to provide the reader with a book report on what the experts think Paul's thorn in the flesh was. That is not your assignment. Rather, your assignment is to listen to Paul and let Paul tell you what the thorn in the flesh was based on clues and hints he gives in his letters to the various churches to which he wrote. In doing this, you will want to look at the biblical passages in context, both their historical contexts and in their literary contexts. The historical context of 2 Corinthians 12, for example, is Paul's defense of his apostleship in the face of certain critics at Corinth who trumpeting their own spiritual superiority. Paul refers to them as quote, super apostles, end quote, criticized Paul for not having the same spiritual resume in which they boasted. Paul, they argued, was a spiritual lightweight who wasn't qualified to give spiritual advice to the Corinthians. Paul, in responding to his critics, touts his own spiritual pedigree, reflecting on his own ecstatic out-of-body experience. Paul suggests that his spiritual experience was, in fact, so superior that the Lord had to whittle him down to size, lest he be consumed with spiritual pride. And so to do that, God gave him what Paul describes as a, quote, thorn in the flesh, end quote, to humble him and prevent him from becoming, well, like his critics. Now, the literary context is 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 12, where Paul confronts his critics, the super apostles, who are given to boasting in their spiritual elitism with a little boasting of his own. Note that the Greek word translated boast, kafkaome, occurs 19 times in 2 Corinthians 10 through 12 and only 29 times in all of 2 Corinthians. Though loath to boast about himself and his apostolic credentials, Paul suggests his critics have forced him into it. And so he engages in what scholars have described as Paul's fool's speech, in which he, in his words, engages in a little foolishness, sinking to the level of his critics and even employing some one-upmanship on them in order to reassert his apostolic credentials and to reaffirm his apostolic credibility. Again, the exploration of the biblical text in order to interpret what Paul meant by the thorn in the flesh, is the assignment of your paper. However, once you have established that, then and only then is it appropriate to move on to today to discuss the theology of Paul's discussion. And by that I mean what this passage and Paul's experience with his thorn in the flesh has to say to modern day Christians today. While this should not be the major emphasis of your paper, you will want to address the theology of this passage at the end, or the conclusion of your paper. And that's what I want to spend a moment reflecting with you about. This is what I call the so what question, the theological question. That is, after we have come to some conclusion about what the thorn was, it is appropriate to ask, what does all of this have to say to Christians today? The larger theological issue raised by this passage is called theodicy. The word comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and dikaios, which means justice. And so the word theodicy means, how do you justify your belief in God when God permits bad things to happen to good people? 
It is sometimes called the problem of suffering or the problem of pain. Indeed, C.S. Lewis wrote a book about theodicy titled The Problem of Pain. The Jewish rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a popular book some time back dealing with this issue that he titled When Bad Things Happen to Good People. In relation to Paul's thorn in the flesh, the issue of theodicy arises in that Paul three times asked God to remove this impediment, but God did not. In behalf of this three times, I pleaded with the Lord in order that he might remove it, meaning the thorn in the flesh, from me, Paul writes. It is an age-old problem over which thinkers and writers have pondered for centuries. It's an issue taken up in the Bible as well. For example, the book of Job deals with theodicy. Job is a good man who is made to suffer, not through any fault of his own. The answer God gives to Job when Job asks God to explain himself is, I'm God and you're not. Sit down and shut up. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's the gist of it. It is the issue in Ecclesiastes as well. For everything there is a season, a time to be born and a time to die. There is nothing new under the sun. The answer to the question of suffering Ecclesiastes gives is, hey, bad stuff happens, deal with it. That is, there is no answer. Perhaps the answer given to the problem of, of theodicy in the Bible is the one given throughout the Old Testament called Deuteronomic theology. It is called that because the book of Deuteronomy routinely gives an evaluation of the various kings of Israel based on whether or not they were faithful to Yahweh. For example, Josiah and Hezekiah were good kings, but Ahab was a bad king. The good kings were not good because they did good things for the people, that is, they brought them peace or prosperity. Rather, they were good solely because they were faithful to Yahweh. That is, they didn't worship pagan or false gods. Moreover, Deuteronomy went further and suggested that good things happened to good kings and bad things happened to bad kings. That is, good kings were blessed by God while bad kings were cursed by God. Now, this moral calculus has come to be referred to by scholars as the Deuteronomic theology. That is, God blesses the good and God curses the bad. This was the theology at work among Job's friends, you will recall, who counseled him, confess, Job, God doesn't punish good people. There must be some skeletons hanging in your closet somewhere. Job's friends are expressing perfectly the Deuteronomic theology so widely accepted by biblical people. But the Deuteronomic theology is alive and well today as well. It is sometimes called the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel. T TV preachers routinely say, if you give God a nickel, he'll give you back a dime. Hear that? Or there must be some hidden sin in your life for God to be punishing you like this. It is the theology, a pretty mean theology in my view, that blames suffering on the sufferer. If there is pain and suffering and hardship and impairment of one sort or another in your life, it's because you deserve it. However, you don't have to live very long in this world to realize that sometimes bad things happen to good people. That is, people lacking nothing in faith and piety and morality sometimes suffer through no fault of their own. How do you justify or explain this? That is the problem of theodicy. Indeed, Jesus ran into this Deuteronomic theology in John chapter 9, where he and his disciples encountered a blind man, you will recall, begging outside the temple. The disciples, seeing him, asked Jesus, Get it now? Lord, who sinned that this man should have been born blind? He or his parents? Did you, did you hear that? That is the Deuteronomic theology. The disciples apparently accepting without question that this man's suffering was somehow his own fault. But Jesus rejected that theology and said, neither he nor his parents. Rather, this man's blindness is for the glory of God. That is, God did not punish this man with blindness because he was somehow a bad man. Rather, sometimes God, though suffering is not his will, nevertheless allows and permits suffering and pain so that his glory and larger purposes can be fulfilled and made manifest. 
This seems to be the resolution to the problem of suffering to which Paul came in his dealing with his own thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is perfected in weakness. Indeed, there may even be an echo here of Jesus' word about suffering and his rejection of the old Deuteronomic theology in John 9. In any case, this is the larger theological issue, the so what question at stake in this passage in 2 Corinthians 12. And in your treatment of Paul's thorn in the flesh, you will want to think about it and reflect on it. Till next time, take care. God bless.